Hello. Thank you for joining me. Um, I'm looking for sort of topics to talk about. And I think one that crops up an awful lot, especially for sort of people thinking about joining the police, maybe, or um, have just joined the police and slightly concerned about all the politics and going on and all that sort of thing. And I get a lot of questions about what's it really like? What is it actually really like? How do we actually um, deal with the stresses within there? because you do tend to get one side you get the official side which is the corporate you know the, the the corporate news coming out from policing about this is what we're trying to improve and all this you know um but of course cops aren't allowed to really talk about it from within you know um and sometimes it's not best to give uh, too much of an individual's thoughts it sort of could expose them certainly within the work that they deal with so i got some water because i've got a bit of a, a cough. i always get a little bit of a cough when i do these and this will come up later actually i'll tell you why i'll tell you now actually because when giving a death message my voice would always get quite dry my throat would get dry in it the very first time it happened it was actually in quite a safe environment it was in a hospital and i went to the people in the in a waiting room um, with regards to a, a road traffic collision. And uh, I said to them, you know, and I knew how I had to give that death message. And it was very direct. You have to be direct. You can't say, oh, I've got some bad news for you. There's, uh, you know, there was an accident earlier. And um, unfortunately, s someone uh, passed away and they're at the hospital here. And uh, because those words don't register and people think, oh, they're at the hospital. They must be alive still. Uh, passed away. What do you mean? They passed by or were they... Um, and they'll hang on to everything they possibly can to avoid hearing the words, your husband is dead, which is pretty much what you have to say, which is exactly what you have to say. You have to say the word dead. You have to say mortuary. You have to be quite clinical, but obviously caring if you can. Um, well, caring, of course you can, as much as you can. Um, but that's the sort of, um, but I, my voice would get really, really, my, my throat would get dry. And, and at one point, that first time I lost my voice, I couldn't talk. And I, I always said from then on, I would have some water with me just before I went in. So, and that was how I knew I could prepare in order to say, hello, are you Mrs. So-and-so? Yeah. Unfortunately, it was very serious uh, road traffic collision um, on this road about an hour ago, let's say the time, uh, and where um, somebody has died. And unfortunately, we believe it was your husband. And uh, so your husband's body has now been taken to this hospital's mortuary. And then you just leave it, wait for them wait for their reaction and the reaction could be one way or another it could be either complete oh right okay well that's you know complete shock or as i've had in the past people one particular incident where somebody committed suicide uh, on a motorbike um they previously tr jumped off a multi-story but for some reason had survived with multiple injuries was a hospital for about six months and they then got on the motorbike, they took off their helmet and they revved it and they went straight down the side of the Sainsbury's supermarket <clears throat> and um, into the wooden lattice that holds up this, this uh, mud banking. Um, and there wasn't a lot left of the top bit of him, so to speak. And, um, and I remember telling, uh, going to the house, knocking on the door, Seeing the woman, hello, you, Mrs. So so, right, okay. Um, do you have a son? So 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 so. Yes, I do. Unfortunately, we believe your son has been involved in uh, such a serious road traffic collision, and I'm afraid he is dead. Um, and we couldn't. And obviously, then I had to discuss with her once she she literally was hanging off me. She hit me with a tea towel a few times. Um, and was hanging off my QRV, you know, um, and, and was just distraught. Her, her knees had buckled underneath her. And then um, it, it turned out that she'd, um, that he'd attempted suicide before, so we were able to talk about that. I said, yeah, it certainly does look as though he was an intentional 
act that he did. Um, and uh, and then the door opened and this massive man came in, in builder's gear. And I thought, uh-oh, if he behaves like she did, I'm in trouble here. And uh, first thing he said was, oh, he's done it, has he? He's done it. Right, okay. And he just went in the kitchen and made a cup of tea. It was almost like it was a relief for him because they'd gone through all these literally decades of, of going through this trouble. Um, I should put that, a caveat with that is is that you never know another year and he could have been all right, you know? So that was his, that was his definition of the situation when it was over. Um, whether he still felt that a day, a week, month afterwards, um, probably doubt, but... Um, some enormous stresses in that family. Now, how do I deal with all the death? The death messages, initially, you see, when I joined the police 30 years ago, there was over 4,000, well, there was about 4,000 road traffic collisions in the UK, deaths, I mean, fatal road traffic collisions. 4,000 bodies every year. Um, and if you think there's 300 people you can get into a jumbo jet, can you imagine if that happened every year? Well, luckily... Um, they've come down to about 2,000 now, just under 2,000. So that's pretty good, isn't it? And, and that's all down to vehicle safety and, you know, you'd say education and all that. But there's more vehicles on the road than there was before. But they are far more safer. And, of course, the police are doing a damn fine job. Um, but you can imagine all those people now. If you're a copper, you tend to think, oh, I wonder who's walking around now who wouldn't have been otherwise. Um, you know? Um, and it's things like COVID. I mean, just I'll be honest with you. It's things like COVID. Some people dead now who wouldn't be other who wouldn't have been otherwise clearly. But there's a few, and certainly not to equal numbers. I can assure you, there's a few probably who are surviving now. And I wonder who those people are. And I'll never know who were driving or walking as a pedestrian, and they would have been knocked over. You know, there's fate, isn't it? Now I'll tell you now. I'm not religious in the slightest. I'm far from it. Um, but I've got a very, uh, I think my, something, something that saved me through 30 years of going to deaths of all sorts of, of, um, suicides and road traffic collisions and natural deaths as well, um, is I'm quite, to be honest with you, quite an emotional person. I, I sort of, I get the old tear a little bit, you know, if I see a certain example of humanity that can get to me something that's really nice something that's really sweet and endearing that can get to me a bit um if i see an old person tottering around a little bit i'm just thinking oh bless him ah, whereas other person would just think oh well, it's just an old person how annoying <laughs> but then my dad was uh he was 60 when i was born so and there was four of us in five years of said this a number of times. So I say that because I, I clearly wasn't an accident unless there was four accidents. But you just sort of realise what they've gone through and things. So it's that sort of humanity. And I think that has been like a, um, a release valve for me that I don't just say, right, put yourself together. Come on, off we go. Um, and also working in armed response as in a traffic unit all traffic officers will know particularly and I can only really speak for those and armed response because in Devon and Cornwall we were dual rolled so we would do the armed response side of things and we would still go to domestics and stuff like that um, when response were used up which was very quickly um, but obviously we could talk amongst ourselves um, so ARVs had a group of literally six officers with me and we would chat, and we were buddies, and we would go out and we'd have a few beers. And, and even though I was sort of, I was very much accepted amongst them, but I was the sergeant, so I felt like I was the parent sometimes. I didn't feel like that, but I felt they thought I was, and there was that certain distancing. But it meant that I could say, right, guys, that job we had the other day, um, instead of saying, no, how are you about that, which is cool, I see that, that's good, and you meant to ask twice, you know. But I think I've always found the more natural thing of, hey, Jim, you know, you went to that one. Did you actually help remove the body on that one? And he went, yeah, yeah, Sarge, I was, uh, 
yeah, well, they were they were struggling a bit, so they asked if I could give her help. So I went, oh, okay. And and what what did you actually do? Did you you know did it, did it come out easily, or was it? Oh no, we had a fire brigade in there, we're cutting and all this sort of thing. So and uh, it gets people talking, and then people go, oh yeah, I did one nasty the other day, and it was this, you know. Um, so generally, I guess really I'm talking about there's. For anyone who's joining the police or anyone who's just interested, basically, you know, what's it actually like? And you never know where you never know how you're going to react. At one point, when I joined the police, you had to go and attend a postmortem. I attended two and a half postmortems, I remember. And I'm, I just remember, I'll be honest with you, I mean, the smell was disgusting and I could never get that was horrible. You know, inside of you does not smell nice. Um, the site I found was fine. Other people fell over. They fainted. It was just, you cannot, you cannot, um, you cannot prepare for that. Uh, I've seen really big guys, something a little bit squeamish. I remember, I know one lovely guy, mountain of an armed response man. And during a first aid course, uh, refresher, where there was some videos of, uh, people may have seen it. There's a, a pig and it's got, um, Cellox that you put in to stop the artery bleed and that sort of thing. And, and it, by the time he'd stood up, walked around, and it was like he was going down the stairs and he just collapsed onto the ground. <laughs> you can't, you don't know until you know, all right, as far as the gory stuff. What I will say was the, I found it quite interesting. I mean, human body for a start, it's remarkably simple. I don't know why doctors just study so long. <laughs> no, but it is, no, it is, I jest, of course, but... It is remarkably simple. It's like I've been on the side of a road where a doctor has tried to save someone's life and they've opened the chest up and they're massaging. The nurse is hard in the, you know, helimed. And this is in Devon. It was massaging the heart and he's moving the lungs aside to try to get to the hemorrhaging underneath. There's not a lot in there, to be honest. It's just massive cavity. And so with a post-mortem, they can't just fix it all back together again because what they'll do... It's really just useful even... I went to a road traffic collision and they looked in for the post-mortem and, and they said, well, they've had their last meal was fish and chips. I thought, okay, fish and chips. So I was able to go back and check fish and chip shops and I found their car turning into this fish and chip shop area on CCTV. So you can sort of draw a picture of what their movement... Well, okay, what were they like? Were they arguing? No, they were fine. Okay, so it draws a picture as to how maybe the collision occurred. Um... Um, and, and so finding the antecedents of somebody, like, you know, literally the history of their demeanour, were they suicidal, were they angry, were they tired, you know, um, those sorts of things is just really interesting. But there's all sorts of deaths, isn't there? They're violent, there's natural deaths. We always have a little chuckle about it. Can you attend to sudden death, please? Yes, it's a 102-year-old Gerald, Gerald Smythe, you know, okay, it took 102 years to die, that one, but... but <laughs> You do get the humour on the side of things. I mean, probably bad humour and fairness, but believe me, it does get you through. And then you've got the young death. That's not so cool, is it? Um, the old death, you think, do you know what? I'd have liked to die like that. He's died outside in the sun, having just had a nice Sunday roast. And he's died in the most perfect position. Love it. Fell asleep. So generally, the police come along. If somebody hasn't been seen by the doctor in the last two weeks... And there's, um, so for example, you've got terminal cancer and you're in a hospital bed. What's the point of bringing the police? Because the doctors can say, yeah, he's, you know, if it's not a surprise, if it's not suspicious, that side of things. I think Arthur's, my dog's trying to get through. So, so oh look, Loughborough University is where my daughter's is. Blooming good university. I suggest you... Send your kids there if they can. It's brilliant. She's rubbish at sport. Um, <laughs> she didn't do. She didn't go there for the sport. So, so the natural deaths they're quite sweet to be honest. But I, I remember going to one in a house and the woman was distraught. Her, her wife was down. His wife was downstairs, and he died in the bed upstairs. And the police job is to go and check the body just to make sure there's no knife sticking in it because that'd be really embarrassing quite frankly if the 
if um, you know people came to take him away and said, "Officer, you might want this sort of thing." So that is the role to make sure there's nothing suspicious. Um, and of course, a lot of the time, the body just releases its bodily fluids and sometimes poo as well, but mostly, and that's usually with hanging, I'll be abrupt, but mostly with sudden deaths, it is, um, they just wee themselves. The mud- muscles relax if they've got full bladder, that's going to happen. And I remember thinking, well, okay, the body's gone, but the bed was really wet. And so I just gathered all the, all the bedding up and I popped downstairs and said, can I just pop this in the washing machine? And she said, oh, yes, okay. So it was just something slightly less, because the, I thought the last thing she would want is to go upstairs where the husband died and just see a big wet patch there. Um, it was probably a memory that she wouldn't necessarily want, really. So it was things as a police officer, you can do that. And um, just to not maybe ease it, not ease it, but just not make it worse, really. Um, and of course you've got younger and, 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 and humanity is shown on all sides of things, isn't it? Because, uh, I remember having, you know, my, my kids are 21 now, but when they were very young babies, when they were babies, um, I was sent to, could, uh, could you go to, um, Derriford, uh, hospital where there was a cot death and, uh, the baby was in the mortuary. Could you go and check it? Uh, and they were the same age as my baby. So I'd be holding basically a dead baby. Um, and a lad on my section, who was a PC, I was the sergeant, and he said, Sergeant, that's all right, I'll, I'll attend that one. And even now it, it makes me sort of water a bit because that's a lot to think. Nobody wants to go to that. And he put me above him on that one because he realised what I would have to go to. And then that made me think, that is just so sweet that I can't let him do that. So I said, no, no, thank you so much, but I, uh, I, I'm all right with this one. And I did tend, and, I, and it was just like a little doll, to be honest. I'll tell you now, with a, with a body, the soul is gone, right? I said, I'm not religious, but there is a soul. So I'm now, I'm alive, and you can see, and you can see there's like life in my eyes, and you can see a colour in my skin. And there's an expression that I use, and I, I use my hands a lot, like this, but um, an expression, I raise my eyebrows, and I, you know, and I'm, but if I'm dead, I am absolutely an expression. It's, it's an expression that you have never recognized before with that person, and they wouldn't actually use. It's everything released and gone. And so even if you were to see someone you do you you recognize you know uh, you'd know they've gone you know so for me that's very easy to that's very easy for me to deal with so when my father died when i was 18 i i see him on google maps sometimes and is <laughs> i'm able to joke about it like that on his on his grave because i never visit it why because he's not there he ain't there. For me, he's not there. For somebody else, every year when their parent or, or God forbid, child has died, they become, for them, it, they act differently. For most people, to be honest, they act very differently. It's, it's like that time's come around again, that they really struggle with it. Whereas me, I will go through his anniversary of his death. I know it was 1988. Uh, I ate was it April? I don't know the day. It's not important. Because for some people, three years is three lots of 365 days. For me, three years is three times 365 days. It's, it's the day's gone. So he died back then. I'm never coming to it again. Do you know what I mean? I'm going through life. And what, how I get over it is in my mind, grief turns to happy memories and you see the happy memories and you just enjoy and I think about him pretty much every day I absolutely do I'm sure and it's always good thoughts it's always good happy memories so that's my way of dealing with it and I'm very fortunate because it saves me the annual stress of the anniversary of his death sort of thing 
it was 79, it was strokes and natural causes. So again, it wasn't a sudden death. It wasn't, and that's a crucial thing. It wasn't sudden, was it? <coughs> so anyway, we've, we've cleared the death messages as such. They've got to be hard, fast, and you, you'll train this. You will practice this, because it's very difficult to know what to say. So it's best to be prepared. I always have some water, because nervousness can just dry your membranes in your throat and things, and it can be very difficult. Say it quickly. Um, but be sure of your facts, first of all. Know that you're telling them the right person. Um, and the younger, it's not so good. That with a six-year-old child in a road traffic collision was awful because guess what? My kids were six-year-olds at that time. Um, and it did. I looked as I approached the, the body being with CPR with another armed response officer giving CPR. Um... I saw his little knobbly knees and it was my son. I, I could see it was my son, but it wasn't. But it was the same shape, same, same, looked exactly like my son. Um, and you think, well, and, and that, that scene, yeah, that shook me a little bit, but I was in charge of that scene and I had to pull myself together a bit. That pulled myself together. I think, right, I've got to get a grip here because I have got to do the family and the coroner, a good job. I've got to give them a good job. I've got to find out what the hell's happened here and make sure that none of my evidence is lost, um, be it witnesses or forensic evidence. So, and I did a, a BBC interview to get a witness, which we found through that interview. That was really fortunate. The girlfriend of the guy we wanted said, hmm, you mentioned a road traffic collision back then. They, I think they want to speak to you. So it really worked. But the BBC interview that I did on the side of the road asking if there was this car, could the owner of this car could come forward. Um, and my mum was listening to it and she said, yeah, that wasn't you, Harry. That wasn't you I was hearing. Because you could tell I was, I'd just seen somebody the same age as my own son being worked on with CPS and uh, CPR and they, they, uh, they didn't survive. And I knew with the paramedics look, again, it was the air ambulance guys, and they looked at me and I, they, I've seen that look. They're just pretty much doing it for show at that point. It's to show the family they are trying. If it was an adult, they would have, would have given up straight away. I think experience shows them when it's likely and when it's not. And depending on the injuries, of course, which were traumatic. Now, traumatic. The difference, right? This is how I find gory stuff and whatever. Gory stuff doesn't really affect me. If you look in horror movies, there's a very good reason they have that spooky music in the background. <laughs> it's to, to put more atmosphere in. That ding, 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 ding. And that's not spooky music. It's that. You know what I mean. And it's... It, it's it creates an atmosphere. And of course, you don't have that. You might have a gravel driveway in the middle of the night like I had, which is pretty spooky that complete quiet and the blow of a wind that might the wind in the trees that might be a bit spooky especially when you're looking for a body in the woods or something and that's the brave bit and then you just got to tell yourself um that if they're dead they're not going to hurt you they're not zombies they're not going to come out and attack you but yeah even in an adult you get the old hair stick up in the back of your your neck but you can't actually go on the radio and say oh well, hello i'm a little bit scared can i have someone come and help me please you can't do it, can you? So you're, and I'm always searching, when you're searching a house for a body, if somebody hasn't been seen for a while, and you sort of, I always laugh at myself, think, why am I opening the doors like, you're like, you know, why aren't you just going, hello? <laughs> I'm sure some people are. They're probably a lot braver than me. Um, but you do, so those thoughts are natural, because I think maybe we've been brought up, and it's that, it's that fright or flight, isn't it? Fight or flight. F fight, flight, or freeze, you know. And so you just got to keep telling yourself and just keep, you know, you're going to be fine. A lot of the time, you know, when I'm walking through an area, so I imagine it in daylight. I can imagine it. Imagine it in daylight. It's a lot easier, especially if you know the area. So that that's a good one for me. Um, but... Bodies, yeah, the smell would be obvious. I found when I'm actually looking for bodies in houses, um, the more obvious there's a body in there, the less likely there is. I mean, honestly, I've, I've somebody hadn't been seen for 
three weeks. Oh, okay. So I go up to the, the window. There's a, I can get through the window and there's a suicide note written on the wall in red ink. It's not blood, it's red ink. A death be on me by Friday sort of thing or something like that. So I, I step in and I could smell rotten meat and I'm like, oh, duh, this isn't good. And it was a, the fridge was open and the fridge was, um, the chicken in the fridge was off and the guy was in prison. So there you go. <laughs> and it so often is like that. And that's why whenever we do checks like that, we always check the hospitals and prisons if they're that sort. But going back to the gory, I found you can only ch chop up some meat because that's all we are really. Um, chop up some meat as much as you like. Okay, chop it up, chuck some blood on it. All right, oh, that looks awful, doesn't it? Ugh, horrible. Yeah, let's chop it up some more. No, 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 blood. <sighs> yeah, I mean, how much can you do it before it just looks like it? Well, you can only chop it up so much is what I'm saying. Um, so that's what I'm thinking about the music behind in the background and all that. It's like, and, and it's that surprise, it's the shock that you may see. So you prepare yourself. And with policing, it's very... It's quite easy because even if I'm going to a road traffic collision where I know I'm the first one there and I know that it's already a fatal road traffic collision, then I'm the first emergency services there. I've still got five minutes to prepare myself. And it's very different because I was I sat on the side of the road in the car and uh, in the police car on the, one of the perches, pig perches they call them, so rude, uh, the observation points. Um, and uh, on the opposite side of the carriageway, a car drove a, a, a a caravan jackknifed in front of me so the, the caravan sort of over the, the car breaks the caravan starts to overtake the car that's jackknifing you can get it with trucks as well if you don't know that already if you do apologize for te teaching you to suck eggs um and then a car came wah, straight through the middle of the caravan and because you're seeing it it's like it's quite shocking you know and it's when you're off duty and you come across or you see a road traffic collision, it's, it's a lot more shocking than I can be going something far, far worse, but I'm prepared and I know I've done it before and I know what to do. And it literally is ABC, I think, right, what's my first step, right? And it is, it's, it's like looking for danger. So I'm going to make the place safe. I'm going to make it safe. I'm going to stick my car in a good place to stop people coming into the scene. I'm then going to get my first aid kit. I know where my first aid kit, I know where it is. Right, just remember that first aid, what you're going to do with it. Right, okay, then you're going to go. You're going to assess quickly which ones, which which casualties really need it. <clears throat> if somebody needs something immediately, like they are airways trapped or they got a catastrophic bleed, do something. Otherwise, step back, update, all right? So I'm going to update control and what I need, what access they can get to that area. Those things suddenly make your brain very busy. Um, and so when you see sort of, yeah, they've, and there's a body there, the bit that I find a bit squeamish that I never really got used to was seeing people who really weren't damaged in any way. They were dead. They looked like they could just get up and walk away. Um, there are, I mean, yeah, there are some horrendous ones where... You know, the decapitations aren't too healthy and um, uh, and it doesn't happen often in road traffic collisions. But it was, the decapitation was quite bad, but it was still, like I was saying a bit more, I, I mean, I will put some warnings on this, but it the, it was pretty gruesome, but it looks like a Sunday joint, quite frankly. What is gruesome more is the fact that body is perfect underneath. And that is the bit that you could struggle with because it links you to reality. It links you to your life and somebody who may have worn that blouse before or something like that, you know. It's those links. It's the, the car of four teenagers I remember seeing who crashed and hit, hit a wall side on. So they all constituted up and were killed, four of them. And they just jeans and t-shirt and they looked like they could they were just going out having fun you imagine they were chatting and laughing just moments before they went around that bend and lost it you know not a drop of blood there as far as i remember it but it was those people that just they just looked like they could just stand up and walk away um that that's what can get you 
more than the gore, certainly for me anyway. Um, Because gore, there's not usually a lot of gore. Because when people die, they stop bleeding. Um, So it's only if they are literally bleeding to death. Um, And uh, yeah, motorcyclist who hit a... uh, And again, I remember a motorcyclist was doing really well around the bends and whatever. And... And a car came out, which would have been fine if the motorbike had been doing the right speed, but he was going much faster than he would have been normally, really enjoying his knee down. Wah! And the car comes out and he just nearly missed the car. He just clipped the back of it and the bike went, whoa, 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 whoa. On the side, grass verge, you think, yes, he's got a nice soft grass verge. Lamp post, head, and he spins around and there was an arc of blood that sprayed around. And I get there, and he'd clearly, clearly dead. I mean, he'd bled out. I'd never seen so much, I'll be quite frank with you. Um, but what was worse, that that was fine. I measured it a metre wide. I think it was six to seven metres length of, of blood. Um, and died straight away but what was the eerie bit is as the traffic built up first I of all I had a double decker bus school bus turn up so they had full view that we needed to cover straight away then I had a police officer turn up and say uh, Sarge um, I think we've got his wife and two children have just turned up at the scene um, and that quick panic was keep them where they are um, it's those lasting memories you don't want people to have. <coughs> but obviously they've got the choice. They can only warn people. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, so again, it wasn't It wasn't the blood. Blood's blood. It's like red ink. It's a big deal. It's the circumstances it's in. And I often think to myself, you know, what is it that stopped me getting the post-traumatic stress that so many others do? Well, first of all, there's a lot of people who don't get it. And I think it's a bit like fainting in the post-mortem or seeing stuff on TV, you know, like uh, like that first aid refresher. You don't know whether it's you or not. So you, <clears throat> and even if you are quite squeamish, doesn't mean you're going to suffer from PTSD. It's do, for me, my personal thoughts are, because a lot of research on it, is what is your outlet? What is my outlet? And mine was chatting to my section, making sure we all talked amongst each other. There was none of this macho stuff, armed response. I mean, they're big guys. I mean, I'm six foot. I'm only 12 stone. I've got some big guys in my sections, you know. Got some little ones as well. But, um, really no macho stuff, really. It was a lot of piss taking and laughs and you could get serious. You could get serious when you're chatting because we've all got families. Um, and I think we all realised that it was actually good to talk. Um, and I think that saved me. I think the way I am, you'd think, my God, there's armed response, 30 years, 23 years in armed response, 30 years as a frontline cop. And he must be hard as nails. And actually, I'm the, probably one of the biggest pussies out there, you know. I mean, <laughs> I, mean I find things quite emotional. Uh, others, my wife will watch a film and she's like what are you doing, you know, and I'm like, God, ah, yeah, you know, it's terrible, so you think, so the, again, there's no relation, if you find you're particularly sensitive, you might find that's a benefit, you know, um, but, the, and the post-mortems I found, especially with the, like, for example, the young kid, I found, when I went to his forensic post-mortem, which turned out to be very useful, uh, the way they treated that six-year-old, was absolutely beautiful. You'd think, you know, post-mortem people, socko, pathologist, <clears throat> and then you've got your mortuary staff, and you'd think it'd be like, you know, but it was like they were alive. It's like they treated that person like they were a hospital patient, you know. It was um, there was something different in that room that day than the adults. And the adults, don't, don't get me wrong, they to- totally treat them with respect, but... It's a job they have to do, and let's find out what happens. And um, and they will, in postmortem, it's a bit strange initially, but uh, um, is because they remove the brain, they weigh it, they might take slices off it to see whether it's got disease or whatever. I don't know what they do, I'll tell you. 
and they take the insides out literally till the your carcass is empty and they ladle out all the fluid bits and they're checking all the different organs and they're looking for any damage and things i never thought of that maybe it's because they can see injuries from within as well yeah um stab wound for example yeah no they, they go from outside completely and they are treating you you're no longer the human being but it's it's respectful don't get me wrong they don't just slam you around on things but there's a job to do for a very good reason in case somebody tries to hide a murder you know ultimately um and closure remember closure is really important for family they want to know whether they died of a blood clot on the brain or not um <clears throat> and you know i've been to somewhere you could see where the hospital staff had done so such a good job trying to save this person's life and the pathologist has been really impressed by the work by the surgeon but it's just failed unfortunately but of course all this then you put they put a plastic bag in the actual carcass of your body and put everything in there that they don't need and then shoelace it up almost so that is the body's there i better put a warning on this hadn't i if you didn't know that already there's very good reasons for it and there's <clears throat> i mean they can't really you know there's no really point putting the brain back in the brain and things people who are might might not be happy with that um but that's the way it is i'm afraid that's the way it is so police officer side of things obviously you need to get the paperwork side of things correct with with sudden deaths and i always told myself when i was checking one of these okay imagine this is a murder i've got to figure it out you know so i can never presume um and it might be a drug overdose okay but did someone inject them or did they so was, what's the paraphernalia around it? anything i wasn't entirely happy with i'd call cid to the scene can you just have a second opinion on this what do you think of this you know um and they were usually pretty impressed you know they were like yeah like it like it so maybe maybe with all this it helps that i'm not religious um i went to church for 16 years my parents they weren't they were religious but they they never really met we did grace at home for meals but we never really they never talked about it it wasn't shoved down my throat so to speak um um so it was never really mentioned at 16 i was allowed to make the decision where i wanted to go and like my brothers and sisters before me we decided we didn't at that point we preferred to lie in on a sunday morning still miss midnight mass though see um <clears throat> but yeah that's that's how it is um and i personally think that's made it easier for me because i not wishing to convert anyone out there i don't have to think about another being out there trying to impress somebody um and i think uh just try to being nice is quite nice it feels quite nice if you're nice anyway so i don't really need someone to to pressurize me into doing that <laughs> and then and i think personally i'll tell you now if i think when people are dead they're dead you know i'd love to think that dad's up there somewhere but i don't i think he's dead i think it's a lot more black and white than that um so there's no ex-pets running around the clouds <laughs> there's no relatives there um <clears throat> and that's probably i wonder if that helps yeah it could be delayed actually i'm not getting somebody somebody mentioned it with ptsd it's, it's like a cup that you just fill and every job you go to is like a bit of water <clears throat> and then and then one day that falls over and i think maybe my sensitive side my emotion side of things is there's a little hole in that it's just dripping out and it's keeping that empty and that every time you debrief someone and you talk about an incident that you go to it's that little it's that littling that water out so that it never comes out the top and that's when you crack so to speak and when there is ptsd i know spoke to it's finding out your way of getting it fixed because it's very different um and it's it's i think it was jason fox was it jason fox I read his ptsd but he found an awful trouble he was a um, special forces um i think i hope i've got his name right um and he couldn't find the way to fix him and he just didn't think it was going to fix him um, and then he did he found what was going to fit him and then he was able to realize and this is what people have told me when they've realized and they've they've come out the other end so to speak 
is they've understood why they were thinking what they were thinking. They've understood. They, they know what it's about. Then they can understand it. Then they can deal with it. Um, so it's not the end of the world if you do. But of course, the other thing, of course, is a lot of things, especially with military. With military, I always think, have got it far, far worse because I've got five minutes, ten minutes warning what I'm going to see. I'm not walking down a place looking at around me, looking for my next um, sniper, and then my mate gets blown up in front of me instantly, and I've got bits of my mate on me. That is different, in my view. That is very different. Um, and that sort of can be a delayed action for 14 years. I say 14 years is about the time when PTSD can come out. So, and I remember somebody saying to me very recently, they couldn't work out, their daughter had a baby, and they couldn't work out why they suddenly fell into this PTSD from what was 20 years since they were in Northern Ireland. And, oh my God, he, he just really, when he understood, it was because when he was in Northern Ireland, when his own daughter was born, he couldn't get to see her because he was involved in this, uh, in the IRA side of things, undercover and under immense stress wondering whether he was going to make it out the next day. And that feeling of his daughter having a baby took him straight back there. So these are the sort of things that can happen, can spark this stuff up. Um, so I think that's, that's it. I think my message really is, is you can't tell until you're there. I am not at all macho. I've got quite a high pain threshold. I had a root canal with no painkiller. I'm cool with that. I find that a challenge. Do you know what I mean? But I am really not. I'm not a hard dude. <laughs> not much. Okay. Um, and yet I find death absolutely fine to deal with on that side of things. Maybe because I have compartmentalized it. Um, and I'm happy with my thoughts. And I think, yep. Yeah. And I would, um, I would almost shed a tear. I try to stay professional. But I am struggling when I'm with someone who's just lost a relative if I, especially if I've told them or or if I'm going back for a statement for an antecedent statement or something about somebody I I met on the road as a body and I'm speaking to their relatives I mean that it really hurts because it but it, then it's really important I find because then do you know what and I'll let you into a little secret as well whenever I went to a fatal and I went to 11 fatals in eight weeks once I counted and I stopped counting at 150. In my last few years, I did very few, actually. Maybe because the fatalities went down by half for a start. But then I, I, I was no longer a senior investigating officer or, or lead investigating officer, they call them now. Um, because I took them away from the ARV sergeants, which I was like more than happy because I was doing VIP, ARV. I was frontline as well. So all the driving stuff. Um, and I was pursuit tax advisor, farms commander, farm tactical farms it wasn't tactical farms I was operational farms commander and and um and farm yeah farms tactics advisor and pursuit tactics advisor so I to be honest I could well deal with that I still went to the jobs but I wasn't leading the investigation so I seen managed but I it was the, the numbers did go down but after 150 I stopped counting them um and uh yeah I um I I just found that that wasn't a problem to me. Um, what I wanted was closure for the families, and that was where the reward came. Is you got a devastated family, but if they knew that you'd put all your effort in, and you'd got all the witnesses, and you'd got the vehicles examined, and you'd gone through the post mortem, and you'd you'd gone through heaven and earth, and you'd found out why that person had died like that, and if they had died because some idiot did a stupid overtake on a blind bend then <clears throat> and you got a conviction for that they knew that they'd been they'd got some sort of justice um and it, they weren't just written off and that's why i get a little bit uh i don't know, I get frustrated but um i'm a little bit frustrated when people say oh you know we know it's an accident why are they um why are they shutting the roads it's because we need to prove offenses and guess what? The courts won't just take it for granted if you tell them something happened. They want evidence. So that was the problem on that side of things. So 
I think that is about it. Any questions, please put down it. Please subscribe to my channel. I mean, the more people that subscribe, the more of these I can do then. Um, and it gets to a wider audience, of course. Uh, please comment. Please like this video because the more it likes, the more it goes around and things. Um, and let me know anything else you want to know, um, want to talk about. Uh, and I can see what I can do to help you. All right. Really good to see you guys. Take care.